This podcast is for general information only and does not constitute any form of advice and tax allowances and rates are subject to change. So on today's podcast and on our YouTube channel, I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Ed Cantello, who, as you know by now, not only a doctor, also a chartered accountant and a chartered tax advisor. How are you doing, mate? Yeah, not too bad. Tell me, how are you at the moment? I'm good. I'm covered in paint and I've got it in my hair. I'm not that grey normally, so I've been painting a ceiling. Presumably, you've been painting a ceiling too, mate. Thank you for bringing up my grey hair there, Tommy. Yeah, very kind of you, but uh, no no paint. I don't think I've ever painted. Yeah, as you know from my walls, they're very bland. Sorry. So we are doing another budget podcast because it's only eight weeks since uh, Quasi Kwarteng and Liz Truss's now infamous mini budget. And we did our podcast on that called Fiscal Incontinence, which was a particularly amusing title about actually what turned out to be, you know, a very, very bad budget, which we called at the time. But we've moved on from that. And we've now got a new prime minister and another new chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, who is the fourth. I mean, I just wrote third, but then you corrected me that it's actually the fourth mm. chancellor this year. Yes. Yeah, we've had quite a few. It's a bit of a joke, really. Right. So what we're going to do today is we're going to break down what doctors and other healthcare professionals need to know about this budget and more importantly, what you can do. Because if you listen to our budget predictions episode last week, when we were on tour in London, which was cool, we weren't actually that far off as we predicted Jeremy Hunt. Can we just call him Jeremy? Because every time I say yeah, his name, Jeremy. I- Yeah, because every time I say his name, I feel like my true feelings might come out. And this is a family show, so I'm going to call him Jeremy from now on. We predicted that Jeremy would freeze allowances, tax rises all round. And I said that I was sceptical that Jeremy would do anything about the tax problems with the NHS pensions. And as we're going to find out, for some higher earners, the pensions tax situation has actually just got worse. So I thought it'd be cool if we rolled back the years, mate, and you could imagine that it's, what, 20 years ago and you're sat in your PricewaterhouseCoopers London office on the Strand and you Mm -hmm. can tell us about the budget, but also I want you to give us what we can actually do. So imagine I'm one of your clients at PwC. Do you think PwC would have a client like me? Well, you've got paint in your hair, so I think they might decide not to go with you. And on your hands as well. Yeah. Yeah, I'm quite a messy painter. Actually, I'm between coats, so we haven't got long. So let's hear it, mate. Yeah, okay. All right, fair enough. So, you know, just a bit of background because, you know, we mentioned it about our kind of predictions for what was going to happen in the budget. I mean, he, Jeremy, basically did warn us well in advance that the news was going to be pretty grim in his own statement. And he didn't let us down on that front. Usually there are some so-called sort of rabbits put out of the hat to where the Chancellor distracts us from bad news with some sort of amazing tax cut or whatever but he also worried he wasn't going to do that over and so it came to pass it was a pretty miserable pretty grim statement i mean what we got was the news that the uk is already recession i think the economy is going to shrink by 1.4 percent next year the government is going to borrow an extra 78 billion pounds more than expected next year and the tax burden is going to hit a record high of 37.5 percent of gdp so who'd have thought to a government would get a record tax burden on us all but anyway against that sort of gloomy backdrop Jeremy, as we're going to call him, announced a slew of tax changes to try and plug the gaps in the nation's finance, which are pretty dire at the moment. Of course, the complete contrast to that disastrous mini budget with the fiscal incontinence in September. So yeah, so we're going to discuss what happened, what the main points were that are going to affect doctors and other healthcare professionals. As always, loads of other things that we're not going to be talking about because we don't think that as relevant. Your personal circumstances may differ. They may be more relevant to you, but here are just the kind of main things. And then, as you say, what can we do about it? What would I be advising my clients to do about it? A spoiler alert, there isn't a huge amount we can do about any of this, but there are some things we can do. Okay. So we will go through them. Okay. There will be some good things out of this. A while back, April, 2021, we discussed a budget given by Rich Sunak. When he was Chancellor, where he announced his freeze on an array of tax thresholds and what was a very sneaky move that we knew was going to bring in extra revenue. And we called it, on that podcast, we called it the deep freeze because the personal allowance, the income tax thresholds and a wide range of other allowances, they were all frozen, which was going to cause a process which is called fiscal drag, where the government doesn't really change very much, but because of their, the way their fiscal policy works, it's dragging people into other tax brackets and therefore sneakily increasing their own revenue. Now. When he did that in April, 2021, that was going to last that free until 2025. And it was estimated at the time that 
that would create 1.3 million people paying income tax for the first time and 1 million more higher rate taxpayers. Now, at that time, the inflation rate was 1%. And you may be aware that, that on Wednesday, it was announced that our new inflation rate is 11.1%. So a bit of a difference there. Wow. Yeah, those golden days, April 2021, you know, it's that with the first freeze. I mean, you know, 1% inflation, you know, happier days all around. But, you know, what Jeremy's done in this autumn statement is he's decided to extend that freeze, which was going to last until 2025. He's going to extend it for another two years until this time, April 2028. Okay. So maybe from the of April 2028, things will change. But at the moment, we're going to have all the thresholds, basically all the personal allowance frozen until then, which is going to add to the treasury's coffers at really an unprecedented scale. I mean, inflation is now running at 11.1%. It's for that by extending the freeze by two years, now means that instead of the 1.3 million people that they predicted would start paying income tax, actually we're going to get an extra 5.8 million people paying tax. And instead of 1 million people paying 40% tax rate for the first time, we're now going to have 4.2 million new 40% tax payers. So you can kind of see that although he hasn't said, right, we're going to increase the income tax rate, you know, he's actually going to get a lot more money from this because so many more people are going to pay tax and so many more people are going to pay at 40% rather than 20. So very sneaky. Sounds like it's, you know, perfectly reasonable, nothing to worry about. Actually, it's not, not great news. Can I just, so I might have missed this. Yeah. He, you mentioned yeah. that he's frozen the, so we talked about this loads, but freezing doesn't sound that bad, but actually it creates something no. called fiscal drag, which is essentially yeah. what you described that although the rate, your pay is going up and inflation is going up. I mean, that's the great thing about being a doctor, really, because we've had a real terms pay cut significant over the last 10 years. So less of a problem for doctors, you might argue, but you're going to hit those allowances earlier. And therefore, as you said, drag in more and more people into the additional rate of tax. You might be mentioning this later, but everyone wants to know about pensions. Yes, we're going to talk about that in a second, absolutely. But we're going to talk about pensions from a different perspective, first of all, which is just, you know, okay, a bit about the chat rather than it's going to affect doctors, okay. But you may have also seen another statement. He is maintaining what's called the triple lock for state pensions, whereby it's going to go up by the higher of sort of 2.5% inflation or the rate at which wages are going up. So what he's done is he's increased the state pension to match inflation. So that's going to be going up by September's inflation rate of 10.1%, which of course, very welcome news for those 12.5 million pensioners who fully rely on the state pension. But just a bit of a, you know, a bit of information, a bit of a side. If the government keep increasing the state pension by inflation and keep freezing the first allowance, it won't be very long before we actually get to a point where pensioners who rely solely on their state pension are going to start paying income tax, which would be the first time in the nation's history that would ever happen. So it's just to say that, you know, these freezes are actually, they sound like much better to freeze the allowances than increase income tax by 1%, but actually it does cause problems for a lot of people. You know, another small, okay, again, may not affect too many of our comrades, but it's also frozen, for example, things like the VAT registration at 85,000 pounds of turnover. And that's going to affect a lot of small businesses who are increasing their prices because of inflation, they're going to have to, they're going to end up having to register for VAT, which is just a huge admin burden and it's causing a lot of upset at the moment in the press. I mean, VAT, doctors don't often come across VAT. I'm not going to go down no. the VAT rabbit hole today. No, no. One P sort of group of people of doctors that do need to worry about VAT is obviously dispensing practices. Yes. Yes. So no VAT impacts on them. They have to register. It's not too bad because although they have to register and it's clean in the bottom with the admin, I think they're zero percent rated. So, of course. Yeah. Yep. So All right. it's not, not too bad, but uh, you know, the, the point of mentioning the state pension, the point of mentioning the VAT threshold isn't to say to people who are listening, oh, this is important for you. I'm not going to say that. I'm just pointing out other ways in which it's quite, you know, quite insidious. It's kind of freezing the all allowances. It does cause a lot of difficulty. And there was one threshold for income tax that did change, and this is going to have an impact on doctor's pensions, which we'll come on to. But the one threshold that did change is that the threshold at which taxpayers pay the additional high rate of income tax of 45%, that has changed. And that was cut from £150,000 to £125,140 from the 6th of April, 2023. And that means thousands more taxpayers are going to be paying tax at the highest tax band, 45%. We've talked a lot about marginal rates on our podcast before, and some of the listeners or viewers, if you're on YouTube, may be thinking to themselves, well, 
why didn't he just cut it to 125,000? Why is it 125 and mysteriously an extra 140 pounds? But the reason is, if for those of you who remember our marginal tax rates or podcasts, et cetera, when you get above a hundred thousand pounds, you start to lose your personal allowance by one pound for every two pounds that you're over the personal allowance. So by the time your income reaches 125,140 pounds, you've completely lost your personal allowance. And the hopefully listeners slash viewers will be aware that at that point between 100,000 and 125 and 40, your marginal tax rate is 60%. Ignoring national insurance, pensions, etc. So at that rate, it's sixty percent. Now above one two five or forty, it's going to be forty five percent. Okay, so a lot of people are going to be paying higher rates of tax. So how else does this affect healthcare professional as well? Appreciate that for a lot of people, you know, unless your income already sits between one hundred twenty five thousand and well one hundred forty and one hundred fifty thousand, you know, perhaps not much is going to change. But there definitely is a snag that might affect people relating to pensions in particular, the dreaded annual allowance charge, because if you get hit by an annual allowance charge and your income is currently between roughly 124,000 and 150,000, that means there'll be an increase in the tax paid on the annual allowance charge from 40% to 45%. You're looking at me like you might want me to explain a little bit more. To you. <laughs> I definitely do want to give an actual example. I've also got an ear infection. So if you're on YouTube, I'm going DJ style. It's really hurting my ear. I've been surfing and kite surfing loads. Winter storms have arrived and the water is so dirty at the moment. It's terrible. So I'm going DJ style, if that's okay, from now on. Well, yeah, I have decided. I did wonder one if it's going on there. <laughs> it's really hurting. I was like, you um, going, what's she doing now? <laughs> Sorry, I was looking in pain because of my ear, but also oh, okay. from what you were saying, because basically this is massive for the annual allowance, right? Because a lot of people who get an annual allowance charge fall in this income range. And so if you're not aware about what the annual allowance is and you want a 45 minute run through episode 121 of our podcast or on our YouTube, a great video that we did recently explains it all. But let's get a spreadsheet out or give me some numbers to make it clear and i'm just going to try and not look in pain with the ear yeah well hopefully this example won't add to the pain you're already experiencing but okay so imagine i imagine you've got a doctor who is earning one hundred twenty-seven thousand pounds in current tax year okay and let's say their pension grew by sixty thousand pounds the annual allowance at the threshold is forty thousand so they've got growth above that of twenty thousand pounds okay if they're earning 127,000 in this tax year, their marginal rate right now is 40%. They're a 40% tax bear. And so on that excess growth above the annual allowance limit, um, that which in our example here is 25,000 pounds, they're going to be paying a 40% tax on that. So they've got a tax bill of 8,000 pounds. Okay. Not great at all. Now imagine we fast forward to the next tax year. So from the 6th of April. 2023, what has changed? Let's keep everything exactly the same. Their income is 127,000. They've got an annual allowance charge due on that 20,000 pound additional growth above the 40,000 pound annual allowance limit. The difference is they're now they've got a tax charge of 45% of the 20,000 rather than the 40% on the 20,000 before. So their tax bill is going to go up by 12.5%. Basically, instead of 8,000 pounds this year, Next year will be nine thousand pounds, and of course, you know it's not beyond the realm's possibility that your actual growth may be way more than the twenty thousand pounds in this example. So, you know, not brilliant news for doctors if they're falling into that sort of annual allowance trap. There, yeah, and I think I mean I talked about this last week before the budget. A lot of doctors were hoping that Jeremy Hunt was going to be the savior on pensions. I was very skeptical. And unfortunately, I mean, no one likes a smart Alec, but uh, I did turn out to be correct on that. But I think the reason why doctors might have thought that Jeremy was going to do something is because when he's been on the back benches, he's been pretty vocal about that. And I've actually got a couple of tweets on my screen here, which hopefully we can put up on YouTube. So in 30th of September, 2022, Jeremy replied to a doctor on Twitter saying, I've been raising the pensions issues repeatedly. And it was a key recommendation in our recent workforce report when, of course, he was chair of the healthcare select committee it is crazy not to fix this when there's such a big capacity crisis in the nhs we'll keep on the case 
All right, so maybe that was just a one-off. No, again on Twitter. His workforce plan for fixing the NHS, number two, grant an immediate exemption for doctors to public sector pension rules, which are currently forcing them to retire in their 50s in alarming numbers. So you can kind of see why some doctors might have thought that Jeremy was going to help. And he's done, well, he's made it worse for some people, as you just demonstrated in your example. Yeah. Absolutely. He's done nothing to tackle all the issues with the NHS pensions, whereby, you know, doing extra work is leading to extra pension charges. And as I say, he's made it worse on a yearly basis, potentially with the annual allowance charge. So yeah, he's done nothing of any benefit and made it worse for some people. Talk is cheap on the back benches. And I'm really disappointed that I was correct, but it's out there. Yeah. Last week, I called it. There was a small blessing though, that there were some potential predictions that he was going to decrease the uh, lifetime allowance, which would have been disastrous, but he didn't do that. So, hey, you know, small mercies here But and it's there. frozen, right? Well, it's frozen. Yeah, it's still terrible. So, so same problem as before, like fiscal drag in the same way that the tax allowances are frozen, freezing lifetime allowance and annual allowance. It's another form of yeah. fiscal drag. Okay. Yeah. Oh no, it's bad, but it's could have been worse. Eh? Is that your trying to, sugar? Trying, to, trying to find some positives here, you know. Otherwise, uh, you know, all our listeners and viewers will be very depressed right now. I'm going to put a tiny positive out there in that he did announce a workforce plan for the NHS, which I think everyone agrees is long overdue. So maybe there's a possibility there. And also, you remember way back to when Teresa Coffrey? I, I so long ago, I've forgotten yeah, how to free. Good names. Yeah, she, I mean, she was making a big scene about the fact that she mandated, or she didn't mandate, that would have been good, but she suggested that NHS Trust could do something called pensions recycling for those opted out. We've got a podcast on about it, but it doesn't fix the underlying issue at all. I wasn't surprised Jeremy's done nothing. Hopefully the NHS Walk First plan will do something about it. But honestly, I think we're starting to get to the point where doctors have completely lost faith. And I hope I'm wrong, but I think we're going to see an exodus of senior talent. And I've been a doctor now, how long have I been a doctor? 15 years? Anyway, the longer I've been a doctor, the more I value experience. And losing our most experienced doctors in that way is a disaster for the NHS, but it's also a disaster for younger, we're younger doctors, I reckon, mate, but younger doctors like us who learn from those experienced doctors. You know, you cannot replace experience. And the more experience I get, the more I appreciate that. So... That's my run over. I mean, yeah, uh, it's it's not good. And for some people, it's going to get worse. And I think the last thing to say is everyone's financial situation is difficult. Before you make any rash decisions about opting out, retiring or anything, please, please speak to an expert. We have many, many, many experts at Medics Money. It's why we started Medics Money, because you need an expert who actually understands the pension. And it is so complicated now that unfortunately, there's very few accountants and financial advisors that genuinely do understand it. Don't take advice from your colleagues. Don't take advice from this podcast. Just find a financial advisor on Medics Money that understands the pension before you do anything, because it's not always bad news. There's things that you can do, but it's not great news. Good summary. Absolutely. Give me um, some good news about taxation on investors. Okay. Well, I won't be doing that. Oh, Wait, you said news. there was going to be, oh, you've got some ways, you've got some things coming that we can do oh, to yeah. get around this. This is just one long chunk of bad news followed by some things we could do to make it slightly less bad. Because it's like, if I was at PwC right now, you were my accountant and I was the client, apart from me being covered in paint, I would be thinking... This isn't good. I'm going to go see like Grant Thornton down the road or someone like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't think they'll be able to do much for you ever, other than suggest how to not get pin in your hair. But, but you know, let's just let's talk about what, <laughs> what's happening to to investors. Because it's the, again, it's not, not great news. He was kind of a little bit boxed in. I think we said on that, you know, when we did that little mini video, because, you know, he's kind of stuck with how he's going to do things in terms of raising more revenue. He can't really... He's already increasing corporation tax from 19% to 25%. That's already going to happen. He's had to backtrack on the national insurance rise for political reasons. And he's said he's not going to increase income tax rates or VAT rates already. So, and he kind of hasn't. He's just frozen the thresholds, but changed the thresholds for obviously additional high rate taxpayers. So he's not actually changed the rates there. So it's all semantics. Anywho, so wait, what can he change? Well, one thing he can change is how dividends are taxed, but also the separate taxation regime for capital gains when people sell assets that are chargeable to capital gains. 
So dividends first, currently everyone in the UK gets a tax-free dividend allowance of £2,000 each tax year. That's going to be cut to £1,000 next year and to £500 from April 2024. So not changing the rates, although they have already been changed fairly recently, but it is cutting the amount of tax-free dividend income that you can receive, which means that more people will pay tax on their dividend income. One thing to say about this tax-free allowance is some people might be listening or watching thinking, well, I don't really have dividends and it's only going to really affect rich people. But actually, one thing about that tax-free allowance is it stops a lot of people that receive relatively small amounts of dividends having to file tax returns. You know, it's there's quite a lot of admin burden if you get, if you earn more than, let's say, a hundred pound of the dividends in a couple of years' time, you're going to have to start, you know, doing a tax return potentially or finding other ways to pay that tax over to HMRC. You already are really overworked. Probably don't want that extra kind of admin burden, quite frankly. The other thing is, maybe with a pension income is, is sort of pension funds. Now, I'd no idea if they actually benefit from the £2,000 to allowance or, or not, but still, you know, anything that affects dividends also affects mainly private pensions. The annual exemption for capital gains tax, think of that as like the personal allowance, but for capital gains tax. So that's your tax free or capital gains tax free amount. And that currently, is £12,300 this year. That's going to be cut to £6,000 next year and then to £3,000 for April 2024, which means technically more people are going to have to pay capital gains tax. Of course, this might not really bring as much revenue as the government hope because people often have more control over when they sell assets and they may just not want to pay the tax. They may just defer any sale in the hope that things might improve in the future. So. Changes to dividend taxation, changes to capital gains tax, they may actually result in people putting off making investments in the first place, which isn't great news. It's almost certainly going to increase the admin burden for taxpayers and HMRC. It's smaller dividends and gains could enter the system. And they're also going to, you know, affect where people sell their assets. If you had an asset, you know, you'd probably want to sell it now potentially rather than next year, or you may not want to sell it at all. Hence, government revenue made full. Overall, and this is a really big point for this podcast, you know, these changes the dividend taxation and the capital gains, they make ISAs much more advantageous than they were before because they're protected from both income tax and capital gains tax. So if you can hold shares or, you know, for example, via an ISA, that's much better than holding them personally. Okay. Or it's become more advantageous to do that anyway. Okay. So definitely think about maximizing your ISA allowances to take advantage of that. Yeah. We love ISAs. You know, it's brilliant. And if you want more on ISA, check out episode 96, which was called the big 4-0 financial things to do before you turn 40. And I'm coming up to 41 now, which is, where's the time, as you can see by my... Oh, that's pain. Mine's genuinely uh, great. Yeah. And I'm 42. Very sad. But the license, you know, there was a, a rumor going around that he was going to scrap licenses, the lifetime ISA altogether, which he didn't do. I think that, would, again, he would probably be lynched by the Tory party. So he's kept well away from that one. Yeah. And if you're under 40, definitely check out that episode 96, four things to do before you become 40. And if you're over 40, you need to fast forward the first five minutes where we talk about licenses, because although life begins at 40, licenses end at 39, well, on your 40th birthday. Yeah, yeah, exactly on your 40th birthday. So make sure you set one up before then if you haven't already before your 40th birthday. Okay, mate. Now tell me about what has been called the Tesla tax. Yeah, absolutely. So that's another change that has been, you know, brought into this sort of statement. So we mentioned before, in fact, fairly recently, I think, that there are a number of tax advantages of having a, an electric vehicle. Because the government have been trying to incentivize us all to switch from petrol and diesel cars. And uh, as part of those sort of tax advantages at present, electric vehicles are exempt from vehicle excise duty. It's commonly called road tax. They're also exempt from something called the expensive car supplement, which affects cars that cost over £40,000. And they don't have to pay fuel duty because the government don't class electricity as fuel. So those are some, you know, good bonuses, benefits of having an electric vehicle or to come and try to switch us to that mode of transport. It's been expected though, it's been touted by the OBR, the Office of Budget Responsibility, who fact-checked everything before the segment, that half of all vehicles on the road are going to be electric vehicles by 2025, which basically means that the government are losing a lot of road tax revenues. It's around, estimated at around 35 billion pounds a year, quite a sizable chunk uh, of money. 
So from April 2025, vehicles are going to have to pay these, what's called the standard rate of road tax levied on petrol and diesel models, which is currently £165 a year, although it goes up in line with inflation. So by the time it's payable in 2025, that will almost only be more than £165 a year. So that's the first change. If you're an electric vehicle from April 2025, you're going to have to start paying road tax. Any electric vehicles bought after the 1st of April, 2025, they're going to be subject to what's called the expensive car supplement, which is an additional 355 pounds a year. And I have to say, I'm not really sure that there are many electric vehicles that cost less than 40,000 pounds. I don't know anything about cars, but that seems fairly unlikely. And they're also making zero emission vans, zero emission motorcycles. Also, they're going to start paying road tax as well. And it's kind of thought that overall, this is like the first step towards introducing future taxes that can be levied on electric vehicles in the future. I think it's like the start. There is some research that suggests electric cars are actually worse for road repairs. They do more damage to our roads than petrol cars. No idea why that's the case. I don't know anything about cars, but it does make sense from a fairness point of view to make them pay something for a road tax. I was slightly confused a bit because I drive a Skoda, which is a petrol car, and I'm sure my road tax is only like 20 pounds a year. It's like an automatic. I pay 20 pounds and Mate, um, the Peugeot, the mighty Peugeot is the same and that's a yeah. diesel. And I'm not, I mean, probably shouldn't say this on the podcast, but when I start it up, it's smoky back there, man, but it says still 20 pound a year road tax. Yeah. And now you've got an electric vehicle, which is much more beneficial for the environment, allegedly, which sure it is now paying 165 pounds as a minimum. So, I mean, yeah, petrol scudders all the way, I guess, or Peugeot's. Yeah, very strange. But anyway, you know, you could argue it's, it is fair for them to pay something because they're going to pay towards the maintenance of our roads. That's how point yeah. of road tax. Yeah, I think, you know, it's good to incentivize, you know, zero emissions and, the, you know, transition yeah. to green energy. But it does seem a bit unfair that they're all cruising around on the same roads as everyone else and paying nothing. And there's also, I mean, we've got a podcast coming up on electric vehicles because I can see in our podcast brainstorming document, which is at about 120 pages now, there's still plenty of incentives for electric cars so yeah i kind of think yeah. it's fair enough yeah and it's not like anyone really kind of bases their car decision making or on road tax i assume anyway so uh, yeah so that's the tesla tax in okay much, so really. we're sat um, in this lovely office pwc on the strand i'm enjoying your pwc coffee and your expensive sofas but ultimately i'm paying you a lot of money so tell me what are your final thoughts and what can I do about this as your hypothetical client? Yeah. I think it's over 20 years ago now because you're locked out of your LinkedIn, but I got a thing the other day saying Ed Cantella oh, yeah. is celebrating 20 <laughs> years at PwC. Yeah, a lot of my friends have said, you know, congratulations on that. Uh, because, yeah, I can't change it because I think my it was my PwC email that I used to set it all up. So uh, yeah, it's still saying I've done 20 years at PwC, which I haven't. I think I got to nine years before I joined medical school. But the first final thoughts, okay, well, other than the fact that the PwC coffee was awful, is that, and this won't help you as my PwC client, but just to say there is a bit of news, maybe some good news you'd hope for our, some of our patients, because I like to think that, you know, it's useful to know what's happening with our patients as well. And firstly, we've already said the state pension is going up by a record 10.1%, which is good news for a lot of pensioners. Secondly, the national living wage is going to increase next year by 9.7%, which pushes the hourly rate to £10.42 for April. So. I know this, that won't benefit doctors per se, but you know, it is, you know, good news for a lot of our patients. Okay. But final thoughts, takeaway points. Okay. So the first thing which you have mentioned already is, you know, make sure that you maximize your 20,000 pounds yearly ISA allowance. Okay. There were some people out there that will say, and you know, they're not necessarily wrong that ISAs can have a disadvantage in some ways because. Imagine you had stocks and shares in an ISA, you don't have to pay any tax at all, but a lot of people weren't utilizing their capital gains tax annual exemption. And a lot of people think that's actually quite beneficial to have. ISAs are now even more advantageous than they were before for holding stocks and shares. Definitely consider maximizing your ISAs, setting up a lifetime ISA if you haven't done so already and you're under 40. All these things, okay or shield you from paying dividend tax and from paying capital gains tax. Okay. So really, really useful. Okay. Another thing to think about is if there's anything that you can do to your assets that you hold, that might also benefit you. So for example, if you own a limited company and some doctors will, will I appreciate 
the vast majority of our listeners and viewers won't. But some people out there do, you know, consider if you haven't already, if you can pay out a £2,000 dividend this year to take advantage of the dividend tax free allowance before it's cut. Okay. If you have an asset that would be chargeable to capital gains tax and you want to sell it, you know, is there any way that you can sell it this year when the annual exemption is £12,300 rather than next year when it's 6000 Is there a way in which you can part sell the asset. So for example, if you've got some shares that aren't in an ISA and you've decided that you need the money and you want to sell them, I'm not saying that's a good idea or a bad idea because your personal circumstances are, you know, you're taken into account, but imagine you wanted to sell some of those shares and they're not in an ISA. Can you sell up to 12,300 pounds of those shares this year and then sell another 6,000 pounds the next year and then another 3,000 pounds the year after that? You know, can you spread out the sale of that asset? Okay. Now again. I'm not suggesting that these are things that everyone's going to be able to do, or even the majority of you are going to be able to do and everyone's individual circumstances, are different. but, but that's certainly what we would be recommending to clients at PwC. You know, is there a way to change your decision-making to utilize things now when they're going to fall in the future? You're my accountant. I want to oh, yeah. ask you some questions. I've just oh. typed them into our document on the fly. I did oh, also I change yeah. Jeremy's surname in one of the things because we use a sort of loose script for this i did change his surname but you didn't read out the humorous version so consummate podcasting no. professional for not falling for my childish changing of one well, letter of mr hunt's yeah. surname let's get okay, cool him jeremy rather than jeremy in the document as well which i see was a typo but uh, who knows who knows no comment as a politician would say so mr cantello i take it all back what i said about grant thornton you are the best accountant i've ever had you're not thinking about leaving pwc and going to medical school or anything like that are you no, you know, I've had 20 years at PwC, you know, I'm going to be there forever, I'm sure. Okay, locked in. Good. Yeah. And what you just said there is just like sort of tax planning. Like like you said, can you do things now to mitigate the charges? But I do want you to tell me about super deductions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. So super deductions, that was something that was brought in by Rishi when he was chancellor as a way to get companies to invest more of their cash, which has been stored up during the COVID years and try to get more investment into the economy. So the idea is... That effectively, if you, let's say, for example, you paid for an asset that cost £100 as a company, so you invested into an asset of £100, you could get a deduction against your profits, not just of the £100 that you paid, but with an extra bonus of 25%. So 125% of your expenditure on certain assets, pretty much most assets, you can claim as a tax deduction. So if you do have your own company and you want to make any sort of investment in your computers or whatever it is, think about doing that now before April next year, because it's going to end from April next year. They thought Jeremy might extend it because it's seen as a very good way. It's a very generous allowance regime for companies to get them investing and the company always banging on about them more investment, more growth and so on, but it obviously costs money and he's scrapping it from April. So think about it. If you do have a company and you you know, do us some money and you do want to buy some assets like, for example, computers. I think there are some things are exempt. I think cars, for example, are exempt. But, you know, look into it, see what you can do and, and get that extra tax deduction. Yeah. And super deductions is why we've got this rather nice microphone here because eligible for super deductions didn't yeah. stretch to buy a new and nice microphone. Yeah, I was going to say, where's my microphone? You know, I, I've just got... You know, How's your monitor? The monitor is very nice. So I will right. Well, there you go then. So it's my eyes. Okay, so hopefully that was useful to everybody. I just want to get to, so we were pretty savage about the not so mini budget from Liz Truss and Quasi Kwarteng. How are we feeling about this budget? Well, I mean, compared to the Quasi Kwarteng budget, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say you think it's a bit better, but assuming that, tell me how it stacks up. Well, the thing about Jeremy's statement is that it. It's kind of sensible, really, given if you think about how awful the public finances are and you can, you know, we can discuss whose fault that is, potentially the people that are actually now trying to get us out of this mess. But anyway, you know, it's a sensible budget in some ways because it's at least trying to be responsible, however painful it is and however much, you know, we won't like it necessarily. It does seem like it's a sensible budget compared to the mini statement in September, which just sent everything into free fall and was not a good budget. Hence the fact that pretty much everything 
apart from the National Insurance Cup has been, and the market seemed to be much happier, although in fairness, the markets are much happier really about the fact that American inflation has fallen, I believe, which is actually more they're looking at. But uh, I think things have calmed down a lot since they realized that actually someone with a little bit more sense is in charge. Awesome. So I really hope that was useful to everybody. Last yeah. time we called it fiscal incontinence. What are we going to call this one? Like semi-continence or? Well, it's just a depressing deep freeze of everything, really. Jeremy's deep freeze? Jeremy's deeper freeze because it okay, had a deep freeze or Rishi. But I just say one last thing as well, which is, you know, I haven't banged on about it this time around because I do it pretty much every single time. But don't forget the really, really basic stuff. Make sure you maximize and know your tax deductions. Okay. Any employment expenses you can claim against your employment income, it's really important to get your tax bill down. And of course, always watch out for anything that might affect your marginal rate. Okay. So we've got about that many a time. You can find loads of information about it. I won't bore you guys again, but those are just some simple things that we can all do to try and minimize the, the pain that Jeremy's inflicted on us all. Really, really important. Brilliant. If you're watching on YouTube, drop us any questions in the comments. We're answering as many as we can there. And on the YouTube about limited company, there's a whole load of great questions which we've answered. If you're listening on a podcast, if you could just give us a rating and a review, that really helps us. And more importantly, if you find this useful, just tell your colleagues about it because we're all in this together and anything that we can do to mitigate the effects, however small, has got to be a good thing. Brilliant. I've got to get painting. And so that's it. Nice. All right, guys. Yeah, everyone take care.